temptation, prison, and dreams of blessing and woe. Hello and welcome. We are jumping right back into the story of the last of the major figures in Genesis. Joseph. Indeed. A couple of chapters prior, Joseph was sold by his brothers to some traveling merchants, who in turn sold him to Potiphar, who was Pharaoh's chief steward. So let us return to Joseph in Egypt and see how he fares at this point in his life. And so we'll begin with chapter 39 and pray that the Lord bless us as we read the sacred word. When Joseph was taken down to Egypt, a certain Egyptian, Potiphar, a courtier of Pharaoh and his chief steward, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him here. But since the Lord was with him, Joseph got on very well and was assigned to the household of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and brought him success in whatever he did, he took a liking to Joseph and made him his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his household and entrusted to him all his possessions. From the moment that he put him in charge of his household and all his possessions, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. In fact, the Lord's blessing was on everything he owned, both inside the house and out. Having left everything he owned in Joseph's charge, he gave no thought, with Joseph there, to anything but the food he ate. These verses set up some major themes in the life of Joseph while he is in Egypt. It also shows how much different he was than his brothers, particularly Judah, whom we heard about in the last chapter. Check out this video if you are unfamiliar with that story. First, we are told that the Lord is with Joseph, and that he gives him success in everything that he does. This is repeated a few times, showing that Joseph basically improves everything that he touches. Boy, it sounds like you got the Midas touch there. Just as Jacob was able to increase Laban's flocks while he was in Padam Aran, Joseph now brings abundant blessings to Potiphar's household. Or, more accurately, it is God working through Joseph that allows these things to happen. In fact, Potiphar was so pleased with them that he puts him in charge of everything, so he doesn't have to worry about anything. But, this wouldn't be a story about one of Jacob's sons if there wasn't some conflict involved. So let's continue reading and see what happens. Now Joseph was strikingly handsome in countenance and body. After a time, his master's wife began to look fondly at him and said, Lie with me. But he refused. As long as I am here, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, but is entrusted to me all he owns. He wields no more authority in this house than I do, and he has withheld from me nothing but yourself, since you are his wife. How then could I commit so great a wrong and thus stand condemned before God. Although she tried to entice him day after day, he would not agree to lie beside her, or even stay near her. One such day, when Joseph came into the house to do his work, and none of the household servants were there in the house, she laid hold of him by his cloak, saying, Lie with me. But leaving the cloak in her hand, she got away from her and ran outside. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand as he fled outside, she screamed for her household servants and told them, Look, my husband has brought in a Hebrew slave to make sport of us. He came in here to lie with me, but I cried out as loud as I could. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran away outside. She kept the cloak with her until his master came home. Then she told him the same story. The Hebrew slave whom you brought here broke in on me to make sport of me. But when I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and fled outside. As soon as the master heard his wife's story about how his slave had treated her, he became enraged. He seized Joseph and threw him into the jail where the royal prisoners were confined. This part of the narrative begins by telling us that Joseph was good looking in both form and feature. And this may have been one of the reasons that he became Potiphar's servant. His age, his health, being physically fit, and even his intelligence would have made him a good servant for someone like Potiphar instead of having to work the fields along the Nile. Of course, this draws the attention of Potiphar's wife, and she approaches him with an indecent proposal. You would lie with me. Now, Joseph is both righteous as well as smart, and so he has many reasons why not to indulge her fantasy. First, he repeats the burden of responsibility that his master has placed on him, and that he will not break it. He also says that this would be an offense against God. Of course, she doesn't take no for an answer, and she hounds him every day, to the point that he doesn't even want to be anywhere near her. On one such occasion, she grabs hold of his outer garment, but he runs off, unfortunately leaving the cloak behind. And this was used to prove his guilt to Potiphar. Poor guy has bad luck with cloaks. No kicks! But let's pause for a moment to contrast this story with that of Judah, 
who went against the Lord, did not enjoy his blessings, and fell into temptation without a second thought. He too left his identifying possession with a woman, Tamar in his case, so that he was found guilty. The difference, of course, being that Joseph was completely innocent on all points. It's interesting that the text says that he left his cloak in her hand, yet when she tells everyone about the alleged assault, she says, he left his cloak by my side, which shows his guilt. In fact, she leaves it there by her side as she waits for her husband to get home, to use that as evidence against Joseph. Also, it shows a little bit of her character in the way that she addresses her husband, saying, it was that Hebrew slave that you brought here into our house. She kind of sounds a little bit like Adam, who says to God when he was caught for sinning, it was because of that woman you put here with me. And so no one takes responsibility for their own sin. In fact, this little barb against her husband may have been why he wasn't that harsh in the punishment for Joseph. In fact, chances are that their relationship wasn't all that good if she was lusting after Joseph every day. Not to mention that her story wasn't all that credible. If he assaulted or attempted to assault her moments before, she had only her word to prove it. And he did not try to recover his cloak, which would be used as evidence. And he had always proven himself to be trustworthy for what could have been many months or even years that he served them. To save face, of course, Potiphar had to appear to support his wife, so he threw Joseph in jail, instead of handing him over to receive the 1,000 lashes, which is recorded as being an Egyptian punishment for attempted adultery. Attempted rape would have been even more severe, including death. So let us then continue as we read about Joseph's incarceration. But even while he was in prison, the Lord remained with Joseph. He showed him kindness by making the chief jailer well disposed toward him. The chief jailer put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners in the jail, and everything that had to be done there was done under his management. The chief jailer did not concern himself with anything at all that was in Joseph's charge, since the Lord was with him and brought success to all he did. Sometime afterward, the royal cupbearer and baker gave offense to their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two courtiers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the chief steward the same jail where Joseph was confined. The chief steward assigned Joseph to them, and he became their attendant. After they had been in custody for some time, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the jail, both had dreams on the same night, each dream with its own meaning. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he noticed that they looked disturbed. So he asked Pharaoh's courtiers who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why do you look so sad today? They answered him, We have had dreams, but there is no one to interpret them for us. Joseph said to them, Surely interpretations come from God. Please tell the dreams to me. Before we get to the dreams, let's look at a few things. First, we are immediately told that the Lord was with Joseph. Even the jailer liked him. In fact, he trusted him so much that just like Potiphar, he puts him in charge of everything so that he doesn't have to worry about anything. Sometime later, two members of Pharaoh's royal court are then put in prison as well. Now, some translations say that one of them was the royal butler, but the Hebrew is better translated as the one who gives drink or cup bearer. The other is the king's or the pharaoh's baker, being the one who prepares his food. These individuals would have been the overseers of vineyards, barley fields, and cellars, and all things relating to meals for the royal court, respectively. Because of Joseph's status and job within the jail, he is appointed as their attendant. Then we are told that each had a dream the same night. These were different dreams, but stuck with each man. The strange occurrence suggests that the dreams were not ordinary dreams, but rather with meaning, as verse 5 tells us, and that they were troubled by their dreams. This supernatural understanding of dreams was not unusual for people both in Egypt as well as in Canaan. Dreams were believed to be one way in which the divine could communicate with people and oftentimes allowed them to predict future events. We have seen how God has appeared to both Abraham and Jacob in their dreams. However, God does not always appear in the dream, but may use a dream as a warning or glimpse into the future. Recall that Joseph dreamed about his brothers and parents, although this has yet to come to fruition. The men are downcast because they suspect their dreams have meaning, but there is no one to interpret them. If they were still in Pharaoh's court, they could have gone to one of the shrines or priests of their gods to gain an oracle, but instead, Joseph offers to interpret for them, asserting that interpretations come from God. Notice two things about this. One is that Joseph uses the generic term for God, Elohim. So for the Egyptians, he could have been speaking about any of their gods. 
instead of saying Yahweh, in which they would not have understood. He uses the same term when he talks to Potiphar's wife. Also, when asked about the dreams, Joseph doesn't take credit for himself that he can interpret the dreams, but says that it is through God that will allow him to interpret the dreams. So, what are these dreams? Then the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. In my dream, he said, I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. It had barely budded when its blossoms came out, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes, pressed them out into his cup, and put it in Pharaoh's hand. Joseph said to him, This is what it means. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your post. You will be handing Pharaoh his cup as you formerly used to do when you were his cupbearer. So if you will still remember when all is well with you that I was here with you, please do me the favor of mentioning me to Pharaoh to get me out of this place. The truth is that I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and here I have not done anything for which I should have been put into a dungeon. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given this favorable interpretation, he said to him, I too had a dream. In it, I had three wicker baskets on my head. In the top one were all kinds of bakery products for Pharaoh, but the birds were pecking at them out of the basket on my head. Joseph said to him in reply, This is what it means. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and have you impaled on a stake and the birds will be pecking the flesh from your body. And in fact, on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, when he gave a banquet to all his staff with his courtiers around him, he lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and chief baker. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office so that he again handed the cup to Pharaoh. But the chief baker he impaled, just as Joseph had told him in his interpretation. Yet the chief cupbearer gave no thought to Joseph. He had forgotten him. There are a few things that we see happening in these passages. There are the dreams, the interpretation of the dreams, the plea to the cupbearer that he will remember Joseph's plight, and the fulfillment of the dreams. Now, this is very similar to the narratives that we will see with the prophets later in the Bible. Of course, the plea of the individual is replaced with a plea that the people will turn back to God. We'll start with the cupbearer's dream, because this one has been picked apart through the centuries by interpreters. First, there are those who claim that historically, the Egyptians would not have been cultivating grapes during this time in history, but were rather beer drinkers, or made wine from barley. This, they suggest, like the inclusion of camels and other stories, comes more from the author's view of the world than what historically occurred. However, more recent scholars see no reason why the Egyptians would not have made wine from grapes, as it was so prevalent in the surrounding regions. Also, the manner in which grapes were squeezed and the juice drank immediately by the pharaoh is taken apart as inaccurate. But remember, this was a dream, not a dissertation on the winemaking process, and dreams by nature are symbolic, and this is exactly how Joseph interprets them, through the inspiration of God. And this interpretation is a favorable one, and when Joseph makes the connection that the cupbearer will return to Pharaoh's service, he takes this opportunity to make a request. He relates the story of how he was taken from his homeland and how he was wrongly accused, hoping that the cupbearer would put in a good word for him to Pharaoh. His interpretation of the dream also encouraged the baker, who assumed that he too would get a favorable outcome. Unfortunately, the interpretation of his dream was much less encouraging. It is interesting though that Joseph uses the same term that he did for the cupbearer when he said Pharaoh will lift up his head, but for the second person he says he will lift up his head off of him, uh, referring to his execution. Now this is a particularly uh, horrendous execution for the Egyptians who put a lot of importance upon the burial of the body so that it would be intact for the afterlife. Then we are told that both interpretations came to pass just as Joseph had foretold. Unfortunately, the chief cupbearer forgets all about Joseph when he returns to his station, so Joseph remains left behind in prison. In a similar way, those warned by the prophets often forget their warnings and remain apart from God. We'll continue the story in the next episode, but what can we make of this narrative so far? Well, the theological message is quite simple. Even in difficult times, God can be found if we are only to look. Even as a slave, Joseph was still successful in all his endeavors. He did not waver, but maintained his faith, and God blessed him. When he was accused and thrown into prison, once again, God blessed him, and once again, he was successful. He trusted in the Lord, and the jailer put his trust in Joseph. He was able to interpret the dreams, showing an act of kindness to the two officials, when he saw no reason to believe that he would benefit from it. 
He only asks that the cupbearer return an act of kindness if he has the opportunity. Up until this point in the story, everyone, save his father Jacob, has either treated Joseph poorly or has forgotten him when he needed them most, going back to when his brothers threw him in the well. It is interesting that Joseph also refers to the prison as a pit or hole. Just as Reuben never returned to rescue him from the hole, both Potiphar as well as the cupbearer forget about him. Of course, we know that the story is not over yet, and it will be God who will rescue him, because ultimately, he is the only one who can. I also believe that some of the life lessons from the story are equally important. Throughout all of this, Joseph never acts like the victim. There's none of this woe is me nonsense. Quite the opposite. When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Sure, it sounds cliche, but the expression does sum it up nicely. Joseph has one misfortune after another befall him, but he does not crumble or give up. He does not fall into temptation or despair. Instead, he works hard and gains the trust of those around him. He helps those that he works for to be successful, and in turn, he is successful as well. And even when he mentions to the other prisoners the injustice that has befallen him, he doesn't say this for pity or even as an accusation, but rather in hopes that they might remember him. What a tremendous example of integrity. His faith tells him that God is on his side, so he does not despair or feel sorry for himself. He does not abandon God or lose faith in humanity when things don't go his way. Instead, he lifts up his head and does what he knows how to do. He works hard, remains faithful. Joseph may be known as the dreamer, but his head is not in the clouds. He is grounded and confident, even during trials. Thank you so much for joining me, and please join me next time when Pharaoh has a dream that needs interpreting. Until then, remain faithful and do good.